So now we'll continue our discussion on nutritional needs by entitling the next flowchart Nutritional Needs 4. And so previously what we looked at were vitamins. Vitamins were organic compounds. Now we're going to focus on is the other half of the small quantities that we need within our diet, which are minerals. Minerals are different than vitamins. They're often associated with one another, vitamins and minerals, right? But they're different because these are inorganic nutrients. These are inorganic nutrients that we consume from our diets that are still going to be required by cells, even though they're inorganic, even though they're not mainly carbon-based. That's what organic means, carbon-based. So inorganic nutrients required by cells, and there are going to be two types of minerals that we'll cover. All of the minerals that are necessary to know are in figure or table 41.2, much like the vitamins were in table 41.1. So how do we get minerals from our diet is our first question to answer. And these are usually going to be ingested as salts. They'll be ingested as salts that are dissolved already within the food that we consume. Also sometimes within the water that we consume within food slash water. Remember that term, mineral water? It makes sense that it's called that because we dissolve minerals within that, and food itself will have minerals also. So there are two basic types of minerals to cover. The first type are major minerals. So let's take a look over here. What are the major minerals that we consume and that are nutritionally required for the success of our cells? First and foremost, we'll begin by looking at calcium. So calcium is an inorganic nutrient required by our cells. Calcium is necessary for bones, of course, as we know, they function in the success of bones and also in the formation and success and maintenance of teeth. Calcium will also be important in blood clotting. So we're just going to be labeling out a bunch of different functions for a bunch of different minerals throughout this flowchart. Blood clotting, calcium plays a role in, and also calcium plays a role in nerve transmission, the movement of messages via the nervous system, and also muscle function, as we know from our muscle lecture, the skeletal muscular system, the musculoskeletal system, I should say, from that sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium plays a big role in both of those. Um, so that's our first major mineral. There are about seven, I think. And next on the list is phosphorus. These are all things that you see on the back of many food labels and percentages of them, and these are the reasons why we need them. Phosphorus is needed. It's also needed because it plays a role in bones and teeth. Phosphorus is necessary to create ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? And that's why we need phosphorus, among other reasons. It's also necessary for, to form nucleic acids. And if you remember, nucleic acids have that sugar phosphate backbone. Keyword here is sugar phosphate phosphate, that part of the backbone that's within DNA and all nucleic acids, needs to be given to the body in the form of phosphorus originally. And also phosphorus will be found in another thing you probably heard of, phospholipids. And of course these will contain phosphorus as well, as a mineral. So that has to be consumed by the, who are the individual within their diet at the adequate amount. So calcium and phosphorus. Continuing our journey through the major minerals that we need, another one is sulfur. Sulfur is going to be important because it is the structure, it is the molecule that forms the disulfide bonds. Now, why do we need disulfide bonds? Well, these bonds, disulfide bonds, are usually going to be necessary in many different proteins. So there's an amino acid that specifically utilizes disulfide bonds. And in order to make sure that that amino acid is successfully being formed by the body, you need to make sure that its component, sulfur, is successfully within the body, and that comes in the form of a mineral nutrient that's consumed. Uh, continuing this, we would now also have to look at two that go hand in hand, uh, potassium and sodium. These are both positive ions that we consume. Potassium and sodium are the main positive ions. So we'll write that down. Ions are just charged particles. Main positive ions in both cells themselves 
and also the intra uh, the interstitial fluid that surrounds the cells that's not blood but sort of that lymph-like material so main positive ions in cells and interstitial fluids thus they're going to drive a lot of the uh, osmotic uh, Full of osmotic flow of water to a cell or away from a cell based off of the amount of potassium in or not in the cell. In addition, they will be utilized in nerve function as we've seen many times before when we looked at the nervous system. They will be utilized in maintaining an ion balance. That's kind of what I was referring to in terms of the osmotic flow and uh, pressure and drive based off of how much potassium is within the cell, how much sodium is on the outside of the cell, and also, we can call that what I was just saying as the idea of maintaining a successful water balance based off of hypertonic or hypotonic outcomes of both of these. In addition, we have main positive ions and we also have a main negative ion. The major negative ion that's within us, that's consumed by us with our diet, is chloride. Chloride serves as the main negative ion. And in addition, chloride will function because it's an ion and also the idea of water balance. It will also function within nerves. So we'll have a nerve function, nerve function, and the chloride will also be very important in a, uh, compo a very important component in an overall uh, fluid-like material that we know as gastric juice. And if you remember, gastric juice has HCl within it. Cl is the chloride, right, produced by those parietal cells. So we have chloride serving these functions. And then finally, last major mineral to cover is magnesium. These are not necessarily all of the minerals that we consume, but these are the major ones of focus. Magnesium is going to serve as an enzyme cofactor. So it serves sort of like a, a vitamin type of role, but it's inorganic, thus we can't consider it a vitamin. And magnesium, generally speaking, will have a role in muscle and nerve function. I think a big commonality that you can see, a big common denominator amongst many of these, is the function within the nervous system. So minerals very much are involved in nervous transduction and transmission and sending and receiving messages overall. So those are our major minerals. Um, there are about seven here, I think. And then finally, that's one type of mineral. The other type of mineral that's not major minerals are what are known as trace elements. So that's number two. There are two types of minerals. Either they're major minerals or they are trace elements. So we'll do that separately on this side of the flowchart. Trace elements include iron. Iron is necessary to have successful hemoglobin production and function. Hemoglobin is a molecule, uh, is, is a protein, I should say, that's within our blood cells. And hemoglobin will serve as a major uh, protein that functions in oxygen transport. So that's very important. We need oxygen to go to the right place at the right time whenever necessary. It drives out all the cell respiration that's going on within the body and so it's very important that hemoglobin does a good job and hemoglobin can't do a good job unless iron is being su sufficiently consumed by the body, by the human that's, uh, that the, by the human in question we should state. Iron is also going to be important in structures known as cytochromes. Cytochromes, we've seen these before. These are laden throughout the electron transport chain. They cannot be made. These structures cannot be successful unless iron is consumed. And also, last trace element to cover is iodine. Iodine is something we've seen before, very important function in maintaining and making sure that thyroid hormones are successfully produced at the right amounts. Thyroid hormones, very generally speaking, are in charge of many homeostatic functions, so homeostasis, and also ensuring that metabolism is correctly functioning. Now, one thing we want to just mention, major minerals are considered major if you need to consume at least, at least 200 milligrams per day. That's basically the, the distinction as compared to trace elements. The way we sort of classify these is that you need less than 200 milligrams a day. That's why we call them trace elements. So that covers our look at minerals and that concludes our look at the nutritional needs. What we're going to now be focusing on is the lack of this if we have not completed the nutritional needs by looking at malnutrition.